Um, I'd like to next welcome uh, Cassian, uh, who's, who's joining us today from the University of Texas and the Anderson Cancer Center. Um, Cassian, if you'd um, like to go ahead and get us started, we'd um, love to hear your presentation. Uh, can you guys all see the screen, by the way? And you can hear me okay? Sorry, I had to put the ears on. There's a little bit of a ambient noise. And uh, um, I, I know the title's changed a little bit, but uh, this is um, uh, a slide that uh, describes the topic of this particular discussion, um, which is really looking at another aspect of COVID immunity. Most people have been fixated on uh, neutralizing antibodies and serologic response. Um, and I think um, as a testament to the um, flexibility and agility of NIH, there was probably an oxymoron, but I think in, in this particular case, it, it turned out uh, that we were able to um, repurpose our lab and the supplemental uh, funding provided by the NIH to uh, shift from uh, our pancreatic cancer work to COVID-19 work. Um, this is a busy slide, but I think I only want to point out two things here. One is that uh, the coronavirus family includes non-pathogenic viruses. Some of you uh, recognize these, uh, this nomenclature, and then also the pathogenic coronaviruses, um, the SARS, uh, the MERS, and then the SARS-CoV-2, which we're discussing here. Um, just a brief biology so that you can understand which structures we're talking about when we talk about T-cell responses. And the spike glycoprotein is what binds to the uh, ACE uh, uh, receptor and, and delivers the um, the virus, sorry about that. I don't know if I can go back one slide. Uh, kind of messed up there, there we go. Um, but then the, the coronavirus obviously has RNA, uh, nucleocapsid uh, envelope. Um, and so we're talking, gonna talk about structural versus non-structural proteins. And most of the antibody responses are directed against structural proteins like the spike glycoprotein protein and S protein or S response, which most um, IgM, IgA, IgG uh, serologic assays are, are directed against. So this is, uh, again, I'm just gonna ask you to focus on uh, three things here. One is uh, the antigen load in purple. Uh, hopefully this is a successful uh, response uh, in which the antigen load increases, induces both uh, antibody and T-cell responses and then angelo decreases now obviously in long COVID or in COVID that doesn't respond to this oh sorry I did it again um, and uh, you're going to see uh, the angelo persist and that uh, correlates with transmissibility um, what I'm focused on is this T cell response in the light blue here. Uh, this is a little bit um, misleading because um, this does not represent um, what you see here um, necessarily a productive or protective response. It's just a structural measure of the antibody. Uh, and what I'm going to focus on here is, is let's uh, dissect the T cell response a little more closely. And the question is why are we interested in finding T cell epitopes to SARS CoV 2? Um, analysis going on its own. Okay, and, and the reason is because we want to understand the natural history of T-cell immunity. It's much harder to measure T-cell immunity than to measure serologic response. Um, and then plus, if you measure these responses properly, maybe we'll predict um, whether you're protected or not or how bad um, uh, it can go for a particular individual and also the effect of uh, certain interventions. So um, this is a paper actually, <laughs> Just one year's work, one and a half year's work, I, I have to um, really uh, um, commend uh, Dr. K. Pan and Dr. Yulin Chu in the lab who um, really drove this research uh, in a very difficult time and uh, it's coming on PNAS uh, very closely. Um, sorry, I need a time check. How much time do I have? Because I forgot. Do I have five minutes or 10 minutes? You have uh, 10 minutes and you're about three minutes in. So you have Great. plenty of time okay. to expand. Yeah. Uh, I'll try to not give you too much of a pressured speech here, <laughs> but I do want to point out one very important aspect here, which is that when you're looking at, when you're looking at the T-cell response, you're looking at a bit of protein that's brought onto the surface of the cell, um, which is um, a nine amino acid sequence, nine, a nine-mer uh, length peptide, um, or, um, or 14 mer if it's a class two CD8 response. So I'm just gonna focus on the class one CD8 T-cell response. So CD8 T-cell, uh, through its T-cell receptor recognizes a nine amino acid peptide sequence brought to the surface, which is um, bits and pieces of a protein. Now that protein can come from anywhere, come from the surface, come from a, a non-structural proteins, come from transcription factors, what have you. Um, so the T-cell response is much broader than a potential antibody response. And, and the problem is that you can't predict 
what this is just by doing silicon analysis. And I think that is the whole point of this discussion in the paper is that if you want to find out what that peptide is, you go where the money is, you loot off that peptide from the MHC of SARS-CoV-2 infected cells or expressing cells, and then you run through a ton of mass spec with a bunch of algorithms that we then use to sort of prioritize the peptides uh, that we have. And now this is supposed to be a T-cell with a T-cell receptor. And what I'm showing here is that we not only we pull out the peptide, but we validate its immunogenicity, meaning that um, that peptide is not only processed and presented on the surface of a virus infected cell, um, but that you can induce a T cell response. And that T cell response comes from normal human peripheral blood um, mononuclear cells. That T cell response is sufficient to recognize um, an infected cell. So it has sufficient affinity to recognize that target and that peptide is presented with sufficient density that this interaction can occur and leads to killing. And I'll talk about the TCRT in just a minute. But I think this is the structure we're talking about. This is a SARS-CoV-2 genome. There's meeting frames 1A and 1B. There's a spike protein everyone knows about sticking on the surface. And then a whole bunch of accessory genes that are associated with uh, the structure. Um, membrane glycoprotein, MGP, nucleocapsid. Uh, uh, this one we're going to talk about in just a minute. Now, remember, there's a whole huge part of the gene dedicated just to survival uh, and function of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. The spike protein, as it turns out, people have gone and looked at T cell responses, just looking at this part of the spike protein because, oh, well, you know, it's accessible, let's go for it. And they've come across a number of peptides. So you can see these are lists of peptides, some nine or some longer shown along here. And a number of different individuals have published on this and have made a big deal of the fact that there are immunodominant responses, that there are dominant T cell major responses, not only in people infected with SARS-CoV-2, but apparently in healthy donors as well. And so if you look, just visually these tall bars here um, uh, represent what they, other scientists have called uh, immunodominant responses. And it turns out, oh my goodness, they also found in healthy individuals who've never been exposed to SARS-CoV-2 as, as they know. So they're saying, oh, well, there's some cross reactivity and so on. And this makes it like a great story. And I'm not saying it's not true, but I'm saying it's flawed. And, and the reason it's flawed is that People have taken a whole bunch of different peptide epitopes, um, and you can see here the whole list uh, coming from different parts of the protein. Uh, and they've looked at responses in patients, and they see variable responses, um, and that's great. And in fact, if you look in the meta bio archive, there are 2,000 class one epitopes and 1,400 class two epitopes. So these are all predicted. Now, just so you understand even more deeply into why I'm a little bit uh, passionate about this, is that you can take any peptide that binds the MHC very well, that's predicted to bind. So you just map along the sequence. You throw that into PBMC, you're gonna get a T cell response. Now, whether that peptide is actually presented with a T cell response is relevant or not, for the most part, and you know, this is a controversial statement probably, is that all these studies ignore that fact. They just wanna know this reactivity. And some of it may be hit, some of it may not, but we decided, okay, let's go for it. Let's see, for these immunodominant epitopes, people are predicted, okay, they're all predicted, do they actually generate a T cell that recognizes the target? And unfortunately, we did all this <laughs> work Kate did actually, generate T cells, we pulled them out, we expanded, we sorted them. You can see it's nice cluster, meaning they're all angel specific for this peptide epitope. We do not recognize the uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 expressing targets. So zero flat, completely flat. You can see that right here. So not relevant as far as we're concerned from an imaging standpoint. So these are predicted, but they don't list the response that recognizes T cell. What do we do instead? We, 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 we went for the money. We went after the peptide. We did the mass spec analysis. We looked at all these genes. And in order to make this as effective as possible, we um, engineered uh, angio presenting cells to express these different parts of the SARS-CoV-2 um, and with different HLA alleles to be as broad as possible in the coverage. You can see we highlighted here, non structural protein, uh, membrane glycoprotein. Uh, we did the analysis. Um, we ran it against the database to make sure that these uh, genes actually are expressed. And so this is how we substituted what we used to use tumors now, but now we use the SARS-CoV-2 engineered cell. And then we ran through this protocol, as I explained to you earlier, we generated T cells against these peptide epitopes and then tested that these T cells do in fact uh, kill the engineered cell. And this is an example of a mass spec and you can deconvolute, you get a peptide sequence. Um, and this is what we got. Okay, we published five of these, but there's actually 18 of these. And you can see that four of them um, are found in a non-structural protein. One of them is found in membrane glycoprotein. And the top line is the sequence. We took the sequence from SARS-CoV-2 and we compared it to all the sequences in the other coronavirus families. And we see there's some uh, identity and there's also some misidentity. Um, and it's possible that, you know, if you were previously exposed to one of these, um, sorry, 
one of these other viruses, you may still elicit a response to the um, SARS-CoV-2 specific T cell. Um, that's interesting. It's just interesting. But what's more interesting is that turns out these targets, and I've shown again the same five targets here in the non-structural protein region and also the memory glycoprotein protein region, is that they're highly conserved among all the variants, alpha variant, and I don't show delta variant, but the delta variant as well. These are the uh, uh, variations, but you can see there's no variation. And you know, it's highly conserved, partly because the non-structural proteins may be responsible for helicase activity and so on. So we did this whole process that I did before for the predicted immunodominant dominant found no responses, but here we did it. And we showed that uh, in summary, that these T cells, they do respond to the peptide flow targets, but they also respond um, against um, the uh, uh, endogenous expensive membrane driver protein, lots of killing here, lots of killing here. Um, and I can show you the same thing for all four of them, uh, five of them all together, the nice killing. Um, so these are, we believe, immunogenic relevant. Just to complete the nuts to the bolts, I've got uh, 30 seconds over time, sorry. Um, the last point I'm gonna make here is that we're gonna pull out the T cell receptor and prove in fact that that T cell receptor can transfer specificity. Um, so here we are cloning our T cell receptor, transfer specificity, non-specific T cells, just random peripheral lymphocytes and also recognize, and we, we do that, it's published and just to prove from nuts to bolts that, you know, predicting does not lead to SARS-CoV-2 cloning, but in fact, what you need to do is do the elution, oh, sorry, do the elute peptide uh, some of them are predicted, of course, among the 4,000 are predicted, but you have to go after the specific ones that are eluded, and we actually have a whole bunch now, not just against spike and we're protein, but sort of non-NSP uh, helicases. Um, and I think that the question that we want to answer is, you know, is this assay with a more select group of peptide epitopes, these T cell epitopes, going to be relevant for looking at these T cell responses in more detail? You don't throw in those three or 4,000 uh, and then hope that you'll get some uh, relevancy. And I think um, these are the questions that we're going to be asking um, as we move forward. And then the last thing I want to make, uh, not everybody knows about Maurice Hillerman. He's he's a hero. He should be considered a superhero. He saved millions of lives literally because of vaccine strategies that he implemented for a lot of childhood diseases, rubella and so on. I'm speaking as rubella. And also, uh, Zhang Yongjian, who literally within 48 hours turned over the SARS-CoV-2 genome into the public domain, for which BioNTech, Pfizer, and everybody else has made billions of dollars uh, making these vaccines and saving lives. And it was because of his work that really we, we get to where we are as quickly as we can. And I just want to thank everyone here and prove in fact that this was a supplement <laughs> that came out of a pancreatic cancer grant and led to this sort of collaboration. So I thank the Commons for allowing us to uh, um, display some of this work. Thank you so much.